Welcome to Gulf South Outdoors. In case you haven't figured it out, we love scuba diving just about as much as fishing. And I really like fishing. And while we've dove the Bahamas, Belize, Honduras, Turks and Caicos, and recently Cuba, our very favorite place to dive is the Florida Keys. So every year or so, we'll head down to the Keys where we rent a house or a condo and then get in that clear, warm water. And one of our favorite outdoor activities is diving for lobsters. Now, when most folks hear the word lobster, they think of large snapping claws. Well, that or a large bowl of melted butter beside a plate filled with a large tail just ready to eat. Wish we had some now. But the lobsters typically found in Florida or the Caribbean are called spiny lobsters, and they have no such claws. And it's a good thing, as claws would throw an entirely different light on hunting them. Two, one, zero. The fact that spiny lobsters are not armed with claws doesn't make them easy prey. Lobsters are typically found at the opening to coral caves. When threatened, they simply retreat back into the reef where they are safe and can't be reached. The first step to catch them while diving is to approach very slowly. The next step is to coach them out of their hiding place by making them curious or by using a tickle stick to bump them in the back of their body. As they emerge from the cave, the trick is to ease them into a small net, or if you're fast enough, simply just grab them. But they're also really quick. It's amazing how fast they can move backwards by flapping their tails once they're out in the open. I've also used a snare with a loop designed to slide up and over their tail. Of course, one little bump and they could escape before you have time to close the noose. I've had plenty do that. But once the lobster's captured, it's into the catch bag, if it's legal, or to be set free. In the past, I've seen divers spear lobsters, but I've always viewed this as unsportsmanlike. Indeed, Florida has now banned the practice as it's impossible to confirm they're legal before killing the creature. You must have a measuring gauge in your possession when hunting for a lobster to ensure the carapace exceeds three inches in length before removing them from the water. Short lobsters or females with eggs must be released and the limit in the Florida Keys is six per person per day. While lobsters have been around for over a hundred million years, such conservation steps are necessary to preserve the species. Of course, some of us are better at catching lobster than others. I was the one who captured the biggest lobster of this trip, or really any trip we've ever been on. Yeah, right. I would love to see you try to catch a lobster half that size. Your biggest catch is a huge imagination. Anyhow, after harvesting and cleaning your catch, the next step is the feast on bugs. That's the cool name for lobsters. Though it hardly seems like an apt description for something that tastes so good grilled with lots of that lemon butter you were talking about. When we come back, we'll take you back underwater with the Coral Restoration Foundation and show you firsthand some of what they're up to. Stay tuned. The popularity of diving has put a great deal of stress on our underwater resources. One way to deal with this has been to create marine sanctuaries or no-take zones where all marine life is protected. If you saw our two Cuba episodes, they took place in the Garden of the Queens Marine Preserve. While this has helped, there are other problems such as coral bleaching. The Coral Restoration Foundation, or CRF, 
was formed to take an active role in not just protecting, but actually restoring coral reefs in the Keys and other areas of the Caribbean. Alex Dufel works with CRF and is here to tell us all about their program. I'm Alex Dufeld. I'm with the Coral Restoration Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit marine conservation organization based in Key Largo, Florida. We've been actively restoring coral reefs since about 2007. And the way that we do that is by growing small fragments of endangered species of corals like staghorn and elkhorn in our offshore nurseries. And then once they reach a certain age and a certain size, we actually plant them back onto the reefs in the areas where they've seen the sharpest declines. We're trying to do this so that we can restore some of that lost uh, genetic diversity and overall reef diversity. These corals are keystone species. Uh, they provide habitat for a lot of different fish and invertebrates that people down here in the Keys rely on for economic value, whether that be the fishing industry, the tourism industry. Uh, so we feel like what we're doing has a lot of very real applications to people's everyday lives down here. Here we have a model of one of the coral trees that we use in our nurseries. This is the structure that we actually grow corals on. Uh, and we have some dead coral skeletons here that we've painted to sort of model what this would look like in the nursery setting. So this tree is made out of a PVC pipe trunk with fiberglass rods that represent the tree branches. And each one of these branches can hold between six and 10 pieces of coral. So all told on a tree that's between 60 and 100 fragments. Um, these are staghorn corals right here. We can also grow elkhorn coral in the same configuration. And we've also started using these tree structures to grow star corals as well. Now with the star corals, they're a little different because they're not a branching coral, they're a bouldering or a mounding coral. Uh, but we use plastic ID cards that the corals will actually grow onto. Uh, and then when they get large enough, we can remove them from the cards and plant them on the reef just like any other coral. This tree here has a base so that it can stand on land, but in the nursery, in the water, this tree would actually be anchored to a duckbill anchor that's driven into the sandy bottom and then floated with lines and uh, styrofoam floats so that they are suspended in the water column and they can sway with the currents. This also helps protect the trees and the corals uh, from major storm damage and also keeps them from being run over and destroyed by passing boats. When we plant the corals, we typically plant them in groups of three or 10 in a group called a cluster. And when we plant the corals, we want to give them enough space that they can grow individually for a little while, but keep them close enough that they eventually morph into a single large colony called a thicket. And these thickets are what actually provide that habitat and that structure for those reef fish, for those invertebrates. And it's the mature thicket that will actually spawn after four or five years on the reef. Spawning is a critical process for these corals because without spawning on the reefs, the corals would experience a genetic bottleneck and they would eventually die off. So it's really critical that we get these corals out on the reef, see them survive for four, five, six years, get them to the point where they can spawn and actually begin to replenish their own populations naturally. When we're in the nursery to actually collect the corals to be prepped to go out on the reef and be planted, we'll come to a tree like this and we'll look for pieces that are about this size or maybe a little bit larger and we'll cut them down from their monofilament attachments. We'll then take the corals and organize them by genotype into milk crates, which are then taken up onto a boat and placed in tubs of fresh seawater. The boats can then travel to our outplanting sites, which are usually no more than 30 or 45 minutes away from a nursery, and they can then be placed right back into the water where they're ready to be planted. That's really cool. And when we come back, we'll take you back underwater to show you what they're doing to map the coral. We get our hands dirty to help the CRF. Manually surveying reefs where coral has been planted is a really time-consuming and laborious process. So Alex and David Gross are developing photo mosaic technologies that will simplify this. The first step is to mark an area to be surveyed with weighted floats at the corners. Then Alex swims back and forth over this area with three GoPro cameras mounted on a pole and they're taking continuous photos. 
One problem they encounter with their funding sponsors is answering the question, hey, this is great, but is it working? Does the coral you plant survive and flourish? It's a fair question, and with the program underway now for several years, it appears that it is working. But showing proof is critical. Once back in the lab, they then use a software program that stitches these images together into a single large map of the bottom, and that allows the entire restored reef area to be reviewed at one time. The concept is to repeat this periodically such that the growth of large areas can be accurately determined. When we come back, it's time for the clip of the week. Stay tuned. This week, we have a double clip of the week. On our recent trip to the Florida Keys diving, we had a bizarre experience when trying to release an egg-bearing female. As soon as I removed it from the net and released it, immediately it went jetting away backwards and into the catch bag my dive buddy David Gross some 20 feet away. But as if this wasn't crazy enough, the very next lobster I caught was short, so I released it too and this lobster swam right at my buddy David, and he proceeded to catch it barehanded. It was amazing. Awesome clip. For your shot at Clip of the Week, submit your videos to GulfSouthOutdoors at gmail.com. When we come back, it's time for Hook It and Cook It. Well, from the catch to the kitchen, it's time for Hook It and Cook It. All right, today uh, we're going to do a stuffed lobster dish. Uh, we have brought in some live Maine lobsters. They're about, right around three pounds, so they're going to be a pretty good, uh, pretty good size to them. We've had them as big as six and a half pounds, which are pretty monster, but seems like right in the two to three pound range or even a pound and a half range. It seems to be a good, a good size to eat for the Maine, the Maine lobsters. Uh, also down here, down south, we have the spiny lobster. Uh, unfortunately, it's not in season when we're filming this, so we couldn't get any. Uh, so we're, we're doing a Maine lobster today, which is also very delicious. Uh, they have the big claws. They're the very familiar lobster that most everybody's familiar with. Uh, so when we serve it in the, in the restaurant, people are like, oh, they, they, they look at it, it's that deep red color, and they know that's, that's a big lobster, and it's really delicious. And today we're gonna, uh, we're gonna have a whole lobster, and we're gonna steam it for a couple minutes. It's gonna be live when it goes in there, and we're gonna steam it for a couple minutes, then uh, uh, split it open, uh, clean it up a little bit, and we're gonna stuff it with uh, uh, look at like a, just a crab and crawfish stuffing, really. We're gonna put a little bit of clarified butter over it, a little bit of seasoning, and then we're gonna kind of roast it in the oven slowly for a little bit, and then uh, uh, take it out and serve it. It's that simple, it's an easy, simple dish, and it's just delicious. All right, here's our lobster. It's been in the steamer for a couple of minutes, and now we're just gonna kind of carefully uh, split them open. This could get a little messy. So 
something that you don't really want to eat. Yeah, we'll, we'll serve it uh, depending on the customer's request. Usually we, we cut it up a little bit so it's easy for them to eat and they can just take a, a cocktail fork and we skewer it so uh, uh, when you cook it, it the, the tail doesn't curl all the way up and so it'll be a little easier for them to uh, just take like a cocktail fork and reach in and grab grab a nice piece of lobster or the, or the stuffing out of it. Uh, kind of family style here. Uh, and it's very simple, it's just uh, some uh, local crawfish, local crab. Uh, we make a, a house seasoning similar to Old Bay. When people typically order it in, in the restaurant, not always, some people just order it as an entree to themselves, but I see more and more often like you get a, a, a group of four or a group of six and, and they kind of make their own surf and turf with it. They'll, they'll, it'll be a nice big three to five pound lobster and they all kind of share it and they'll all order a small steak. It's very typical. It's a nice little dish to share, uh, kind of family style here. And uh, we just top it off with a little clarified butter, a little bit of lemon juice and voila, it's, uh, it's delicious. Thanks for joining us this week on Gulf South Outdoors. Make sure to tune in next week for another chance to find your outdoors.